Wendell Gal, from the University of Arizona, study abroad in a low lie or becoming a Chinese. Please welcome. Hi, um, good afternoon. Welcome to my talk today. Um, my talk's title should be Study Abroad in China, Being a Lao Wai or Becoming Like a Chinese. Um, but there was a, a word limit for the title when I submitted the abstract, so I left out the in China part. That was actually the important part. Um, anyway, um, so what I'm going to talk about today, for, the, for those of you who are not familiar with the term Lao Wai, it actually is a term that refers to white people in China. So what I'm talking today is really about language learning and race, um, which we haven't really seen much about, which I think is really, really important. Um, if I have time in the end, I'll talk about future research directions as well. Um, so first of all, why am I interested in language and race? First of all, we have seen a lot of work in you know, applied linguistics and social linguistics and linguistic anthropology as well about studying the relationship between language and race, particularly in the works, for instance, by William LaBeouf and Jane Hill and more recently Mary Buckles, so on and so forth. But we haven't really seen much about language learning and race and language learning, second language use and race. Um, and that's actually really important, especially when you talk about study abroad, because race is actually uh, interpreted differently in local contexts, in different local con cultural contexts. We have seen almost only one study about race and language learning um, in Spain, as a matter of fact. And then in the East Asian context, we have seen sort of a portrait of gaijin, which is a Japanese term to refer to foreigners, outsiders. Um, but these studies tend to portray these as national identities, less than, uh, more than racial identities, plus um, the, it, we have a very similar term in Chinese, which is called lao wai, which can be roughly translated as a big outsider. And what I'm going to talk about today is the case of lao wai, especially by focusing a group of students, white students in China. And uh, we have seen in previous research that uh, white students are sort of seen as the privileged uh, outsiders. They are, they are the people with the privilege. They are not expected to speak Chinese. They are not expected to be a member of the local culture. How would that impact their language learning experience and language use experience? That's what I'm trying to answer today. Um, so if we look more at the term of Lao Wai, uh, we have seen in, in previous ethnographies of, of, of foreigners, especially white people's life in, Sh in Shanghai, in a big city where I conduct my research. For instance, I quote Gamble 2003 here, that um, he said, when strolling the city, I often heard this term, Lao Wai, used in the gossip around me. It revealed a key, a key organization, organizing fa factor in Chinese society, the distinction between insider and outside in this case, um, the distinction between China, Chinese, and outside, outsiders. And then he said, I could never become Chinese, and I must learn how to be a foreigner in Shanghai. Yet at the same time, this is not purely just a biological trait. There are certain aspects of that racial and national identity that's related to language use and, and social practices. Once again, as Gamble said, a typical list of characteristics of Chineseness includes physical features in the words of a popular Chinese song, you know, black hair, black eyes, just look like me. Um, but also, they have Chinese culture, that is, they speak Chinese languages, we have language there, they eat Chinese food in the Chinese way, and have 5,000 years of history, whatever that means. Um, and as a result, for him, who spent a lot of time in China, he said that um, because he spoke Chinese, he consumed local food, and his knowledge of the local customs and affairs allowed him to become called as half Chinese or like a Chinese person. So in this sense, this racial dichotomy of being a, a, a white person and being Chinese is not a dichotomy. It becomes a continuum. We have on one hand being an outsider, a white person, and on the other hand being like a Chinese, but not really a Chinese yet. But that part is more about what you do, including language that you speak. So what I'm trying to look at is really how they negotiate the status on that continuum. And um, this is another background that is important here. Um, this is a very, very popular song in China a couple of years ago um, by the singing group. Its, its title is actually the Chinese language. And you can see in the chorus part, it's really about skins of all colors, hairs of all colors, learning to speak language that makes Chinese, the language, powerful in the sense that it makes the world listen to us seriously. So it sort of, remind, it sort of reminds us of what Baudu would say, language and power, that language gains its legitimacy and, and positive status through other race, 
through other people's learning and appreciation, appropriating of these linguistic and social practices. So what I'm trying to do in this project originally was I wanted to study the language and identity among second language learners in urban China, especially in, the case, in this case was in Shanghai. Um, the site was a study abroad center located in Shanghai. It was a longitudinal study that I conducted um, over the spring semester of 2012. Um, I had 20 volunteer participants. Um, in this presentation, I will fo focus on four of them who were all white students um, and also their interaction with Chinese roommates and host families, which made my total participants eight. And my research questions were, first of all, how did, how did, how did these students respond to their identity of being Lao Wai? And then secondly, in what ways does this identity of being Lao Wai affect their experience of learning and using Mandarin while they're, uh, with, their interac uh, uh, with, with their roommates and host family members while they were in China? So I had a lot of data. Um, what I'm going to focus on here today would be really more sort of the qualitative data from the surveys, interviews, and observations. If you have any questions on the data collection, please feel free to ask me after this presentation as well. Um, so first of all, I'd like to present to you the, one of the female participants, Alan, a pseudonym. She lived with a Chinese roommate in the dormitory, the Chinese roommate I gave her the pseudonym, uh, Helen. And she had previously studied in a northern China, uh, Chinese city for one semester. And the reason, when asked in the background survey why she wanted to live in the dormitory with a Chinese roommate, she said, I thought living in the dormitory would offer more freedom than a homestay, as well as more opportunity to make friends. So here, she was hoping to make friends. And because she had studied abroad in China before, she was aware of this cultural discourse of Lao Wai. And at the beginning of her time in Shanghai, she said, um, everyone will tell me that I'm a foreigner. I am Lao Wai. This also hurts me because I feel I'm not a foreigner. I know I am, I really am not Chinese, but if you hear me speak in Chinese, I forget I'm a foreigner. And she originally was speaking um, Mandarin to me in the interview, but she felt so frustrated that she had to speak English to make that point very clear. She said that I spent a lot of time and effort trying to understand the culture, um, but then I get stuck in this bubble. You don't hear everybody speaking Chinese to me. See, you see that how language and race sort of intersect. And as soon as I leave that bubble, people speak to, start to speak English to me and they will point out that I'm not Chinese. And then she said, you know, I will never be Chinese no matter what I do. So that sort of frustration. But over her time in Shanghai, especially through interactions with her Chinese roommate, we do see change here. For instance, um, this is from my observation notes. In May, um, we were going out together. This was a very ethnographic project. I was sort of doing participant observation with them. And Helen told me when Ellen was absent, she said that, um, that Ellen was very Chinese, very Zhongguoren in Chinese. And I asked why, and she said that um, she, um, Ellen uh, consumed this Chinese food, preserved eggs, which was actually related to a very, very popular post at that time in China from CNN. This was the, the post was about. So CNN reported that the most revolting food that I've had, so this was seen as something that outsiders, Lao Wais, why people cannot take this food. This is a part of being authentic Chinese. And because Alan was able to consume that in the Chinese way, she was seen as being very Chinese. That was part of the evidence. And then I asked her to elaborate more. Um, and then she said that Alan also did not go out very often to bars and clubs. That was also seen as a trait that often American white sojourners in China would do, but she was not doing that. Um, and the, the next episode was also really interesting. We were walking the area that had a lot of um, American European style restaurants and bar. And Helen said, there are so many Lao Wais around here. And then Alan said immediately, I'm also a Lao Wai. And then Helen replied it. Um, we no longer think of you as a Lao Wai. So you can see there's change going on. And Alan, when Helen said there are so many Lao Wai, she was really not thinking of Alan as a Lao Wai. So at the same time, if we look at um, their, their dorm rooms, I also did um, sort of side artifacts collection. So you can see on the on this side, you can see I'm really bad at telling left from right. So I'll just say this side, you can see that's, that's, that was Alan's desk, um, the wall of this desk. Uh, this was also, they were actually really right next to each other. They, they, this was where their, a lot of their interactions took place. So on Alan's desk, you can see um, a lot of um, 
a, a, a big collection of pandas. So that's sort of appreciation of what is commonly seen and thought of as Chinese culture. And you can see a lot of, she was very, very um, explicit about her appreciation of, of Chinese culture through her uh, appreciation of, 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 of pandas. And meanwhile, if you look at Helen, who was also really an interesting case, she was, she has spent a semester here in Florida, interning at a, a music park. Um, and she, on her desk, you can see a postcard from Europe. So she is also a more sort of a cosmopolitan young Chinese college student who had experience overseas and who was planning to study abroad as well. Um, and then we also had another uh, male participant here uh, whose pseudonym was Tuzi. He lived, Tuzi was actually a pseudonym that he selected for himself. He lived with a Chinese roommate in the dorm as well, whose pseudonym was Li. And he also lived in, he had lived in Southern China for six months teaching ESL. And the reason that he wanted to um, live in the dorm with a Chinese roommate was he wanted to use Chinese outside of class. And if you look at his experience, the term Lao Wai did also emerge. Um, because he had stayed in China before, he was aware, also aware of the cultural discourse. And in fact, in Cantonese, there's this derogatory term uh, meaning ghost man, Gui Lao. And he brought it up during the conversation. Then we end up discussing different terms of calling white people, including Gui Lao and the Mandarin terms Lao Wai and also Yang Gui, the foreign devil. And then he said that uh, he found racism against white people amusing. But at the same time, he brought up his ethnic identity. So he's not sort of presenting himself as the mainstream white American. Instead, he's saying, I'm a minority in America as well. I'm Jewish. So which actually really is interesting because in this case, his roommate Li was from Kaifeng in Henan, where there was this very big Jewish community uh, historically. So Li said that, um, that they, he knew about this Jewish community and he also ta talked about, they end up having a very long conversation about uh, different ethnicity and, and culture traits and physical traits. Um, and as a matter of fact, Shanghai was also a place where a lot of Jewish um, refugees stayed in the early tw uh, 20th century. So that was also a place, a, a, a part of the topic that they talked about as well. In addition to that, um, Tuz constantly distanced himself from the rest of the group. He said in the post interview, I go alone, I go outside alone. Um, I find myself alone a lot, a lot. I am more apt to just sit down next to somebody or just strike a conversation with a waiter. Uh, and they usually would be happy to talk to me as opposed to go out with a group. And indeed, he did not go to, he did not join a lot of uh, group activities. He was pretty much alone by himself most of the time. And if you look at his um, desks, once again, their desks, uh, you'll be surprised on this hand, on this side, again, that was actually Toots, the American student's desk. On the other hand, um, uh, the one with the, um, the US dollar was actually the desk of the Chinese roommates. Um, on this side, you can see Toots had his name there, written there, with the radical marked in different colors and also the pinyin. And the reason that he gave his name, the nickname, he always introduced himself using his Chinese name, um, Gu Yi. And also, he also would use the, the, the radical. I'm not sure if um, how many of you here can understand Chinese, but basically, the part, a part of his given name in Chinese has the rabbit radical. So he, he was using this pop culture image, a pervert uh, rabbit, which is a, a, a very common, uh, very well-known cartoon image in China. He was using that as his nickname, and he always introduced himself that way, which really made him able to make, uh, to access local um, communities. And then at the same time, Lee was a very interesting case as well. He at the time was applying to master programs in, in the United States. I know that there were a few presentations today talking about international students here in the United States. And I think by this time, we all know that the biggest international students population here is from China. So that's very common too. And Lee was, Lee is in fact in the United States right now um, studying um, in New York. <laughs> Uh, so he got this $1 bill from Tuzi, and he was sort of knowing, trying to learn more about the United States as well. So they were able to create a lot of conversations and interactions because of that mutual interaction and mutual interest in, in knowing more about each other. Um, and then we have another interesting case, Ring, who was living with a host family. She also selected the pseudonym for herself. She wanted to be called 
as Yun, and she was in a relationship with a Chinese American man whose family was originally from Shanghai. So the reason that she selected to um, study in Shanghai and living with a host family was that she was more interested in learning more about the life in Shanghai and learning more about learning a little bit about Shanghainese as well. And she also wanted to speak um, as much as possible and learn to cook Shanghainese food. And cooking was indeed very important to her um, to, and to the family too. And it was really interesting because in the family there were the son was studying abroad in, in the United States and the host mom actually did not have her own kid there. So they were having this really interesting mother-child relationship. And then um, one day we were teaching Yun how to consume Chinese food, the xiaolongbao, the, dump, the soup dumplings. And the host mother said that she was, Yun was very different from other foreigners because she was so fond of Chinese food. So being fond of Chinese food was seen as an important trait of being like a Chinese. And then the host, host grandmother was also really interesting because uh, she said that the wontons that Yun made was, were very special because they were not made by a Chinese. They were made by a Lao Wai, not one of us. And, and then she said that um, her boyfriend was very lucky because it was like it, as if he was marrying a foreign wife and a Chinese wife at the same time. <laughs> so you can see how there's not only race, but also gender, the intersection of race and gender. And indeed, uh, that was a very, very common uh, theme in their interaction. This was the image of them making the dumplings together. Um, as you can see, they were, he, she was sort of showing her how to make dumplings. And she, uh, the host mother was also really an interesting case because she was um, hoping to immigrate to the United States in the future and open a Chinese restaurant. So that was also a theme, not only her way of teaching Yun how to be, become a Chinese daughter-in-law in the future, but also her way of sort of developing her identity as a Chinese restaurant owner in the future in the United States. Um, and the theme of, of, of gender race was really interesting because the, the term Zhong Guo Yuan, I couldn't really, really translate that term very accurately. I, I roughly translate it as the China Thai. Um, here it recurred in their interactions. As you can see here, um, host mother said that Yun had Zhong Guo Yuan, the China Thai, because she had a Chinese, Chinese boyfriend. But she also told me that um, some previous accidents that happened to the American students studied abroad at the study abroad center, such as excessive drinking, and especially female students. They're smoking and they, them drinking. And then the host mother then praised Yuying, saying that um, she had a very good family education and she was more Chinese than a Chinese girl. So you can see that Chinese, being Chinese, is seen as a positive trait for female, for girls. And being white is seen as something that, for, at least for female students, that's some, that was seen something as negative. And then the host mother also talked about Yuying's um, on, on in February, uh, in April again, it occurred again, and, and the host mother talked about her having this China tie again. And then this, in this case, this would remind us of, of Tuzi's experience. We responded by saying that she was ethnically Italian. So once again, she's not the mainstream American. She's not, she's um, Italian, and Italian of uh, Chinese cultures are very similar because we both were very fond of food, and et cetera, et cetera. So as we are reminded, of Tuzi's experience who was uh, sort of aligning himself with the Jewish community. And here we can see that um, um, Yun was aligning herself with ethnically Italian community here. Um, and, but it's not always so wonderful. It's not always that these students receive the status of, of being called like a Chinese or very Chinese or more Chinese than Chinese people. We ha I had another participant um, whose pseudonym was Mac. And he was also living with a Chinese roommate. He was a first timer, timer in China. He said that um, when uh, he wanted to stay in the in the dormitory with a Chinese roommate because he was worried about culture shock if I lived with the host family. So very different from the other three participants who were like, I wanted to make friends. I wanted to have opportunities. I wanted to know more about the culture. He was, a wor he was worried about culture shock. And um, indeed, before he went to China, he had a conversation with his study abroad advisor in the United States and who told him that he should, to, he should go to um, Shanghai, not Beijing, because Shanghai was more Western. It was more westernized. It was where he could um, transition to the Chinese culture and language with relative ease, um, which is actually something that I find a lot of study abroad advisors would do, 
from my anecdotal experience as well. Um, and then in the meantime, his roommate, Fang, was also this person who subscribes to this ideology of, of foreigners versus Chinese. Um, there was once that he complained to me about the essay assignment that, um, that he had to help uh, Mac work on. And he told me that for these foreign students, he used this phrase, Liu Xue Sheng, which was also culturally meaningful because this, is, this refers to a group of students who live in sheltered environment, who don't have real needs to learn, learn the language or use the language. Um, so he said these Liu Xue Sheng, it would suffice that if they, they can just produce sentences that are acceptable. They have no need to achieve um, discourse level fluency or proficiency. So. As a result, oh, not yet. Um, if you look at their, their tables as well, you can see Mac was, because he was a first timer in China, he was actually really, really interested in learning Chinese. Um, he had been learning Chinese for seven years, but he had never been to China, and he was uh, very excited. And you can see there are some travel souvenirs from going to different places. And that poster, which is not very clear here, was just a local event, a tourist event, that he just posted it. So sort of participation in a lot of touristy events. And then Fang was also sort of um, posting menus for local Chinese restaurants. They don't really go to these Chinese restaurants together. So he was very interested in food and cooking, and he had a lot of cookware in the, in the, um, the dormitory that he probably showed me. Um, and he was always showing these images of food, um, but also not really, you can see not a lot of interaction going on. Um, and how did this really affect the language use? Well, of course, there are many, many factors, but I did look at their recordings from um, March, the, sec the first recording um, in their probably um, around the third or fourth week when they were in China and also the, around the 15th or 14th week in China. And you can see that um, mostly um, a lot of these students and, and their Chinese roommates or, or uh, host family members were speaking Mandarin sentences. But if you look at the number of sentences, Mac and Fang were really frequently speaking English and their Chinese sentences, as you can see, were the fewest among all participants, um, even for Fan, who was a native Chinese speaker here. Um, and then for Mac, the number of Mandarin sentences even decreased over time, although the, the length of recording increased, as you can see. It was actually longer in May than March. So that being said, he was not really being spoken to a lot in Mandarin, and he was not speaking a lot of Mandarin either. So what does this all mean? So first of all, to summarize my findings in response to my research questions, oh, sorry, I'll cue one, two. Um, research question one, if you recall, I was asking how did they react, respond to this identity of being a Lao Wai? These students were really negotiating, well, some of them were negotiating between being a Lao Wai or becoming like a Chinese but never truly a Chinese. Um, and these were done through more like doing, being, becoming like a Chinese. It was about what they do, what they speak, uh, what they consume as food. Um, and these, con the, these negotiations were mutual. So if you can see here, um, first of all, Tu and Yun both presented their Chinese names and they were commented as being like a Chinese. They were using their ethnicity to distance themselves from the mainstream of the United States. And um, whereas um, Ellen and, and Mac, especially Mac, were just hanging sort of um, touristy events, uh, souvenirs on his wall and presenting himself as a tourist in China. Um, but this is not just them. This is mutual negotiation. We also see their the, the people they interacted with were really important here in the sense that uh, Lee Helen uh, were both having plans to study abroad themselves or had lived in the West before. And the host mother was hoping to live in the, in the United States soon as well. Um, and then um, you can see that um, whereas in Feng, he was really doing a lot more Chinese-oriented activities. So these negotiations were mutual. It was not just about what these students do themselves, but also how they were received, how they were seen, how the people um, hosting them were doing. Um, and if we go back to this slide, 
in response to the, my second question, research question, how did it impact their language learning and use experience? Um, of course, there are a lot of um, factors involved here, but I do think that here, being a Laowai, and this is also not just from my own research, but also from previous studies that, are, that have been done, it seems that being Laowai does mean that they are being seen as outsiders that, who are exempted from participating in local linguistic and discursive forms, that is, speaking Mandarin. Um, they were expected to speak English. Um, that was the default. So really, uh, I think in this case, that, that's a very uh, sort of cheesy cliche, but white is a color too in this case, uh, because the relationship between majority and minority is always local. We are more used to seeing the white people as the dominant race here in the United States, but in contexts such as East Asia, it's different and what it means, but then we do have hierarchical structure here, which doesn't mean Lao Wai is pejorative, but in this case, it's more sort of the privileged outsiders because of the global hierarchical structure of language, the spread of English, Lang English is more desirable and the association of language and race in this case, why would they learn English? That was something that a lot of Chinese people would be wondering. And then also another thing is that identity is performed and negotiated. Being a Chinese may not be possible for these white students, but being like a Chinese is, or more precisely, doing being like a Chinese, consuming the local food, presenting yourself as in a way that was seen as local, and language is certainly a part of that negotiation process. And these negotiations involve not only the students, but also the people they interacted with. And on that note, that's the end of my presentation. I do have some more slides, so do ask me questions. Um, if you have more questions and comments that I cannot answer today, please feel free to contact me via this email address. Yeah, Thank you. Mm -hmm. takes place even after you've been to one of the people and maybe they're lower considered. I've experienced that myself. And uh, no, I'm glad you brought that up. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, if no questions, I'm just going to show extra slides myself then. Um, I do think that for future research, we do need to look at people of other races because if being white means being excluded as outsiders, what does it mean to be Asian, for instance? What does it mean to be African American? So I have extra slides. And uh, for instance, this was from my previous research um, a pilot study. And this was about a non-Chinese, being a non-Chinese Asian American, the student was Korean ethnically. And she would say that other people would keep asking, you look Chinese, why don't you speak Chinese? Um, and they would, she, everyone would assume that she was able to speak Chinese. Uh, and, and then everyone would assume that she was um, not American. And, and she ended up saying, I'm Korean. So sort of denying her, her status as, as, as you know, American. And then this is just a comic from a, a common, uh, very popular Lao Wai website. So you can see the contrast between being white and being Asian. Um, and then being African is totally different story. So people touching her hair and people thought, once again, very similar to the Asian American case, people thought that she was from Africa. So she would have to explain, I'm not from Africa, I'm from the United States. And then they had a lot of questions about, well, people would ask him, her about you know, Obama, of course, but yeah, that's a different case. But thank you. Thank you.